I'd like to start off and just say, have you ever read God's Word and just uh, ran across the Word and just stuck with you and pondered it and just like, wow. And you know, we go through life, we go through life, we have issues, we just, we carry on and hold it and we get into God's Word. Next thing you know, we settle down and we start, we start reading. And I encourage you to be diligent in God's word. Read it. You know, read it. Uh, ask the Lord uh, to give you understanding. And most important, apply it. I want to come, I want to read something that uh, I came across, and it's, it's in Isaiah 53. And I encourage you to, to go home, read it. I, I'm not going to read the whole thing. There's a lot to it. But I want to start basically in verse 2 in Isaiah 53. And he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of, the, out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when, he, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as, and we hid as there were our face from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. This is Christ. Isaiah was talking, was predicting the coming of our Lord. It says, "Surely he has borne our griefs, and he's carried our sorrows, our pains." And yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God. When you see, when you see this stricken by God, we're talking about the Father. Struck down his own son and afflicted. He was wounded, pierced through for our transgressions. Violation of God's law. He was bruised for iniquities, our wickedness. This is the point. I get emotional because this is the whole point of God's word was to do one thing, was to lead us, to, was to bring the Son. And here's the point I, I really want to, to hit. The chastisement, the punishment. And if you really look at that and go in depth, let's talk about the fatherly correction. I have a hard time with that. God stricken his own son. Why? He goes on to say, for our peace. That's the, that's the word that I that hit me and I pondered on. Our peace. Shalom. Shalom. To be safe in mind, body. To be complete. To be friendly. To make amends. Make an end, finish, make good, pay. Be at peace, that is perfect. Make restoration, restitution, I'm sorry. And restore. You know, I 
He restored us back to himself. Because as you read, if you read later on, it says in verse, verse 10, Yet it pleased, the, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Everything that we go through in life, everything, any issue. I come from an abused background. I know it's like to be beaten. And yet, I love my dad. I come from a back, uh, background of alcoholism, drugs. I mean, I, I, I can share you what I, I would have been through. But the point is, God laid our transgressions, our iniquities on him. From the first cut of the whip, from the first cut of the whip into his skin, our soul was being healed spiritually. From the first crack and the first shedding of the blood, we were being redeemed spiritually. Yeah, we go through things. We, there's people here who's lost loved ones. But the peace of God remains. the peace of God. I think about the crown. I think about the nails. And as I think about each pounding of that nail, what he's laid upon, that was laid upon him, grace was restored to us. Mercy was restored to us. Forgiveness was restored to us. Love. And yet, his very presence. When we, when we go, when we go home, which our loved ones already have, when we go home, we're in his presence because of what he did. And as we bow down our hearts to him and thank him, for what he's done. Restoration. Peace. Hope. That's our father. You know, God promised, in, even in Genesis, God promised a redeemer. He promised him. Abraham was going to kill Isaac. And God said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I got a better plan. Think about from Genesis to the time of Christ. Shalom. Shalom. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through him be saved. Think about that. The whole point for Christ and the whole plan of God was to restore, bring back peace. Yes, we go through things. We go through issues of life. But that word hit me hard. Peace surpasses all understanding. You know what? God understands. And that's who we need to trust in. His understanding, his wisdom, his guidance. To make complete. He completed it. He completed everything at the cross. Every thorn 
the nails, the beating, the blood. was all for us to redeem man back to himself, to, to redeem his very own creation back to himself. This world is blind, but each of us in this room has a light. So it might be dim, it might be bright, but I encourage each and every one of you in this room and out there listening, pray, seek, get into God's word. I'll give you a little, little hint about myself. I try to make a point between 9 and 10 o'clock at night. That's my hour. I try to spend an hour a day in God's word. Sometimes a miss, but I try to be consistent in that hour. I find time at work. I, I, I get with guys at work. Uh, uh, we have a Bible study on Thursdays that we, that we, have, uh, we do work at, that we uh, get in God's word. But there's nuggets. There's nuggets in here. And one of the nuggets I've found, because I've, there was a lot of issues here lately at work and whole bit. And that, with that aside, peace. Peace. Shalom. Shalom. Completed. It's finished. God loves each and every one of us. He went to the cross. Father had a plan. Now we're part of that plan. We're extension of that plan through the Holy Spirit. Seek, ask, knock. Allow God to do a work in your life to be a light in a dark world. I love each and every one of you guys in this room. God loves, I know God loves each and every body in this room. Yeah, we all have differences. We all make mistakes. We all go through life in general. But I encourage each and every you, as well as myself, be diligent in God's word. Because somebody out there needs to hear it. Be open, seek, and love. It's hard. I ain't going to say life is, you know, life is easy. But love one another as he loves us. Two commandments that was given by Christ. To love, your, to love God with all your heart, soul, body, and mind. And love your neighbor. Everything else falls into place. So I encourage you. Peace. Shalom. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So let's partake in that joyous joyous redemption that Christ and the Father gives to us. You can come up. I'm still kind of new at this, so. <laughs> Blessing your name for all you went through. We are holding the bread, holding the wine to do what you said. Please bring to our eyes our sin, the cross, the tomb, the empty grave. We will remember.
are here in this place looking to you blessing your name for all you went through we are holding the bread and holding the wine to do what you said please bring to our minds our sins So let's hold the bread up before the Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you for the the body that was broken for us. There's healing. In that. Lord, we are so gracious and we are so thankful. Let's partake. Hold up the cup. Lord, I guess this is I get so emotional about this because it's this is this is you. This is what it's all about. Lord, as we hold this cup up before you, you redeemed us with your blood. You cared for us that much. That you died to give us life and for life ever after. Lord, Your word, your heart, your very soul was to redeem man back to yourself through your blood. And Lord, we do thank you. We do thank you for no matter what issues we go on through life, that we can come back to you and your word and for what you've done for us. Lord, we just give you praise and glory and honor. And again, shalom. Let's partake. We read the scripture verse. If I find out what I did with it. Excuse me. <laughs> yes, please stand as we read this together. Should be on the on the screen as well. Colossians two one through three. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Lacedaemonia, And that for as many as I have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, 
and attending all the all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mercy ministry of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You can dismiss your children now. Uh, I get emotional, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see y'all this morning. Julie, good to see you. Real quick, just uh, how's Jack doing? He is doing quite well. He was planning to be here this morning, but he just wasn't quite up to his feet. He just couldn't straight up for so long, so he's going to shoot for next week. Perfect. But he's doing really well. Good. So awesome. Thank you all for all your prayers and all your support. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also have a uh, report from Richard. Richard had a heart procedure this past week. Um, and he is doing well. He's been released. They did some laser work on his heart, and um, he's recovering well at home. I thought he might be here this morning, but continue to pray for him as well. If you have your Bibles, if you'll open to 1 Timothy chapter 3, as we continue our study uh, in chapter 3, the heart of leadership, part 3, as we continue going through what we've been studying so far. So we finished looking at the qualifications of an overseer or elder last week. And this week we pick up with the qualifications of a deacon. Now the Greek word for deacon is diakonos, diakonos. And it means to run errands or an attendant, uh, generally a waiter at a table or other duties specifically in a church as a deacon. It's a minister or a servant. That's pretty much the role of a deacon. And we can find um, our first example of this in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 6, when the apostles, they were studying and they were reading and they were teaching, and then a complaint came that there wasn't uh, a lot of ministry uh, being affected in some of the different people in different places. And so they, they got together and they raised up some men to actually handle some of these duties. And in verse 1 it says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we, we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And we also see deacons along with bishops addressed in the greeting to the church of, of Philippi. In uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus, Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So we see earlier on that there was a need and there was a place assigned for these particular leaders. So looking at the office of a deacon, it's not the same as an overseer. There are some differences, but they serve with the overseer. And this is demonstrated in various ways throughout the denominational uh, groups that we have today. Many of the roles of deacons um, as appointed leaders in the church under the bishop of overseer, They're, they serve in different capacities. The Baptist church actually uses this office differently than most of the others. The Baptist church, the deacons are more like a board of directors which govern pretty much all activities of the church, including the hiring or firing of the pastor. And while the Methodist church has deacons, they're appointed by the overseers, and they have a different levels of ministry. Uh, I've heard in some cases them called the Stevens ministry. You may have heard of that term before. And the Stevens ministry is where they actually have men and women they raise up to actually go out into the community 
and help with uh, errands and things around with with neighbors where people are shut in and they can't they can't help. Maybe helping around the house and, and fixing and building some things. All of them have different different levels of ministry. Now these people again, they're all appointed by the church, but they're called by God, and it's something that we need to understand that in all areas of leadership, there has to be a call upon the heart. It can't be just that I want to do something, and I want to do it for God, and the zealousness that you may have to serve God in any capacity may be great, but if you're you're dependent upon yourself to maintain that zealousness, it will fail, and you'll find yourself worn out and burn out, um, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, here at Calvary Chapel, we don't have deacons or elders as of yet. It's not because we don't want them, and it's not because we don't feel that there's a need for them, but our church, in the size it is, we really don't need them at this point. A lot of times as you grow, there's needs, more needs than the pastor or other leaders can handle, and so we start to delegate those things and raise people up uh, as the need arises. We will call upon those who we believe have already been called, and see, that's what's very important to recognize, too, that in the church, as people um, are growing in their faith, as they're growing in their relationship with the Lord, sometimes you can automatically see them moving into an area of ministry. It's not that they need a title. It's not that they're seeking a title. But if a title comes, they've already been raised up by God to be in place for that to be appointed. And I think it's very important because, again, everyone is called by God to serve in different capacities. And if anyone desires to serve in this capacity, again, I believe he will already be demonstrating the characteristics of what that need would be as they are moving and growing in the Lord. So the next thing we see is the qualifications of a deacon. In verse 8, it says, likewise, speaking again, likewise, meaning the same thing as he talked about the, uh, the elders or the overseers. He says, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double tongued not given to much wine, and not greedy for money. And so we've seen in the, we discussed the wine and the money last week, um, and we won't go into that again. I encourage you to go back and listen to that. It's pretty much the same aspect of what we're seeing. But we do see a little bit different uh, wording here. As he, as he, he mentions a couple things. He says um, uh, to be reverent first. He said he's, he must be reverent. Now the King James Version here reads the deacon must be grave. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, the, the word used, the Greek word for reverend or grave is seminos, and it means to be honorable or honest. And this comes from the root word sebomahe, and apparently it's a primary verb. It means to revere, that is to adore, devout, religious worship. And I believe that this is where uh, the word reverend comes from. I believe that this is why people call some people reverend. They call different pastors reverend or uh, so on and so forth. I personally believe it's an overstep. I don't believe that any man should be called reverend. Yes, they should have reverence for the Lord, and they should show reverence in the things of God. But as an overseer or deacon, they're just men in a role God has called them to. And to take this to that level and call a man reverend, I believe personally that that is an overstep. I believe that God himself and the Lord Jesus Christ are the only ones that that should hold that title. And 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2 says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So a deacon is to have uh, reverence for Christ. They are to... Uh, be honest, they're to have the uprightness and the standing that they should have just as the overseers have, and they should be respected, but they should never be exalted. No leader should ever be exalted or put upon a pedestal, and that goes for deacons, elders, it goes for uh, pastors or leaders of any kind, and I think that's what happens when you begin to call a person reverend is that they begin to kind of feel they might be a little reverend. And then you start thinking about that and what that means, and pride can get in the way. Again, they should never be exalted or put on a pedestal. And 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 7 says, For when one says, I am of Paul, and and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? 
when you begin to raise people up and put your more hope in the individual or pastor or leader or uh, evangelist, whatever the role might be, rather than in the Lord Jesus Christ, that becomes carnal because you're looking at man. You're identifying with man. You're not identifying with the Lord. And Paul goes on to say, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So in leadership, whether again it's the pastor or the overseer, whether it's a deacon, an elder, whether there's any appointed position in the church, they should never be looked upon as reverend. They should never be looked upon as something higher than they are. They're servants. They're servants called by God. Jesus himself came to serve, not to be served. Now, when he returns, he's going to serve a little bit different. He's going to serve judgment. But he came to serve mankind and give of himself, and that's the model that we have. And Paul understood that the minute that the focus gets put on man, everything gets out of balance. Expectations begin to come forth. And we have high expectations that we put on men. Well, since they're that and they're this, then they should be doing this and they should be doing that. And then we start assigning in our own mind, in our own ways, what exactly they should or should not be doing, how they should act, how they should be. And so the expectations usually are set and they're usually too high. Because as in most cases, and this goes in relationships across the board, in most cases, when there are expectations of anybody else, the person with the expectations can't live up to them themselves. But they prefer that somebody else do on their behalf. Well, Jesus already did. So why do we look to man and put any expectation on him to give us anything rather than look to God who has already done it all through Jesus Christ? There's not an expectation that you can put on God that he can't meet. Now, the fleshly ones, the fleshly desires of our heart, he won't meet those. Not that he can't, but he would rather you lay those down and walk in the spirit rather than in the flesh. But secondly, now, pride comes in and the person begins to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. I mean, if you could start treating somebody putting them on a pedestal eventually they're going to think that's where they belong and eventually they're going to fall because no man can sit in this place of, of, of exaltation and stay there he's not good enough for that he will fumble he will drop the ball and the minute that an expectation is placed upon him another one will be upon that another one will be upon that and again the man himself may think, I can live up to this. I deserve this. Come on, give me the accolades. Give me the joy. Come on, can I, can I get an amen? Come on, come on, come on. No, it's not about that. We're to put all of those things aside. And Romans 12, 3 says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So for anyone who has a desire to be an overseer, for anyone who is going to be an overseer, for myself, I put into this group, we are to look at our role as, number one, it's a called position by God. Number two, it's a position that he has his standards for. And I praise God for his grace and mercy. I praise God for his love and his, his ability to continue to sustain me and sustain all those who are called. I praise him for that. And I praise him that he has appointed me to minister to you his word. But my job is not to save you, to fix you, to change you. It's to point you to Jesus and let him do the work. That's what my role is here. And if I try to do anything outside of that, then I've already set myself in a place that I don't belong. So the next thing we see now here as a deacon... And again, this applies to leadership in general, but as a deacon, he says he's not to be double-tongued. In other words, don't lie and tell a different story from one day to the other. Consistency is very important in a Christian walk in general. It's very important because people remember what you say. 
And if you say something today and then say something else tomorrow, they're going to remember that. But you need to have the consistency in your spiritual walk. And in a sense, this goes along with what James says in James chapter 1, verse 26, uh, when he says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So to be double-tongued basically is meaning that you can't bridle your tongue. You can't say truth and then change it tomorrow to be another truth or to tell one person one thing in order to appease and to tell somebody else something else and to appease. That's being double-tongued as well. You can't do that. You have to stay consistent with God's Word. You have to remain in His truth. And when you're speaking, you speak according to His Word. So in context, this is speaking of taming the tongue, but it does apply to what we're talking about here. We do need to make sure that we are consistent with what we say and what we believe. One who is double-tongued isn't following the heart of the Lord because the Lord is truth. His Word is truth. And if you're an appointed deacon or a leader in the church, you have to make sure that you're speaking truth. Anything outside of truth is double-tongued. You can't say this in the flesh and this in the spirit, and both of them agree with one another. They, there has to be a consistency. It leads also to those who believe that the end justifies the means. That's another example of a double tongue. Yes, God wants this, and I believe this is God's plan, and, and we're going to make this happen, so here's how we're going to do it. We're going to manipulate. We're going we're to force the situation. We're going to do it to get people to do what we want them to do, and the end of that will be to bless God because we will have achieved what God wants us to do. Well, that's double tongue. You cannot go out and manipulate people to do what you want them to do to gain something for God. God's not pleased with that. There's no, there's no good in that. If you can't speak truth and good come out of that, then there's no purpose in speaking at all. But to try to color it a little differently or say something a little more whatever, anything like that is double tongue because it's not God's plan that we should lie or manipulate people uh, with our words to do great things for him. He's not interested in that. He can do great things by himself. He chooses to use his people. And we need to be listening to what that means. We need to be studying. We need to be focusing on him. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need it. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He provides and can do whatever he needs to do and, and get it done. And he doesn't need us to rally the troops. It's not my job to come up here and be a positive motivator. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to do it for God. Hallelujah. Sorry about that. I shocked me too. That's not our role. We're not going to be jumping up and down and hooping and hollering and motivating you to do it all in your strength. Garbage. We're to be motivated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And allow him to do his work in us. Now what that means in, for us is submission. It means obedience. It means dying to ourselves. Not for gain. Not doing stuff so that we get something out of it. We're to die to that. And we're to give it over to him. And once again, as we've always said, once where God guides, he provides. He doesn't need our help. All of this belongs to him. Our growth belongs to Him. This building belongs to Him. The chairs that we're all sitting in, everything in this room belongs to Him. It's not ours. And so we have to make sure that we're not trying to manipulate or do anything for us to get something out of it, even if it means more people in the seats. That's not my job. We're to pray. And the way that God's going to fill this house is when He changes this one. And that's what I'm praying for. Create in me a clean heart and a pure heart, O oh God. Sustain me with that everlasting spirit. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me, but fill me and let me be a light. That's what we all should be praying. The change comes from here. And once God is working in each one of us and we're in unity together and the Spirit is moving, then He will grow the church because He's going to bring like-minded people that are seeking exactly what He's doing here. 
It's not going to be a program, and it's not going to be designed, and it's, it's not going to be manipulated. It's going to be trust and obey, for there's no other way. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Now, verse, verse 9 here says that he must be holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. Uh, what is the mystery of faith well, that Paul is, is writing about here? Well, Matthew Henry says this. He says, the practical love of truth is the most preservative form from error and delusion. If we keep a pure conscience, taking heed of everything that debauches conscience and draws us away from God, this will preserve in our souls the mystery of faith. It's holding on to the truth. It's holding on to His Word. It's having a practical love of this truth, of His Word. And then it's applying this love in our hearts and in our minds. That's what's going to keep us in a good conscience, in a pure conscience before the Lord. And I believe that this is referring to the full counsel of God's Word. Because when we understand the full counsel of His Word and we begin to study the full counsel of His Word, we know that this is our truth and this is our foundation. And our conscience If we are consciously focusing on His Word, then when something comes in that goes against it, we're consciously aware of it, and we're able to pray through it. He says that He will always give us a way to escape temptation. And He always gives us a way to walk it out with Him. So we need to walk in that truth. To doubt anything or to deny anything is to fall into false teaching or error. When we step away from God's Word and we add something to it or we take something away because we don't understand it or we don't agree with it. And that's unfortunate, but that's what happens sometimes is that people don't agree with it. They'll start teaching something different as though God, God's okay with that. But He's already laid out His Word. He's already laid out His truth. He's not going to change it for your sake or for mine. It's truth, and truth will stay as truth. So simply put, it's a mystery, this gospel of Jesus Christ, but by faith, we hold on to it. By faith, we hold on to his word with all of our being. And this gives us the pure conscience that he's speaking of here. If we don't believe it, if we don't believe the word of God, the full counsel of his word, how in pure conscience can we be entrusted to leadership? How can we be entrusted to ministry? How can we be entrusted to anything regarding God and His plan of salvation? Because we have doubted or we have taken away and we've, we're doing our own thing. And, and again, that's what's happening in a lot of places today. Sin has entered into the church. The world has gotten in. And when that happens, they'll change, delete, didn't mean this, we want to do it this way, and they will begin to let leadership in the church that has no business being there because they cannot be Christian and act the activity of what they do, the lifestyle that they have, and preach God's Word. None of that adds up. Not based on the truth of God's Word. So we have to have a pure conscience, and we can't allow the world to tell us that we're wrong. Or should I say, we don't, we don't concede to that. They're going to tell us that we're wrong. But as they continue to mouth off, we continue to stand firm. That's what we're called to do. Acts 24, 14 through 16 says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they, uh, to the way which they call a sect, or the way, which is the Christians at that time, they call them that, according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there's, there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. The word of God will bring offense. We're not supposed to be the one to do it. We speak truth. We speak it in love. We speak it in gentleness. We speak it through the power of the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction. We don't go out with the Word of God, which is the sword, and begin to cut people to pieces with it. 
That's not what we're called to do. And Paul says here, he always strives to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. But he believes the word of God. And the law and the prophets all pointed to Jesus. Jesus fulfilled them. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. And we are the ones now that are assigned here in this earth and while we're here to love those around us and love them in truth. Pour out truth to them. In 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 11, he says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the, glory, the Lord of glory. But as it was written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of the man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed to them, to us, through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, Yes, the deep things of God. For what man, what, I'm sorry, for which is in, um, back up for a second. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So, you can't stand up and present God's word without God's spirit. Because you're going to slant it, twist it, manipulate it, do whatever you're going to do with it in the flesh. You have to accept it by faith and allow the Holy Spirit to re reveal the truth to you through His Word and continue to walk it out in faith. So in a nutshell here, here we, we believe the mystery of the gospel. We believe it. We believe it by faith. And through His Word and His Spirit reveals us, reveals to us His truth. And this is what we stand upon. And, and I say this morning as, as clearly as I can say it and as, as boldly as I can say it, that the church cannot, cannot turn away from the foundation of the Word of God. The minute that that happens is the minute that they're on the slippery slope outside of the church and at some point not even Christian at all. We can't do it. We can't afford to do it. We've got to stand firm. The leadership has got to stand firm. And I mentioned, I think it was last week, about the, the, the denominational vote in the Methodist Church. It was 50-50 on whether they should allow homosexual pastors and leaders in the church. And it was the people from the international sector that came in from Africa that actually pointed and pull, pulled everything to the side toward God's Word. But when you think about that, it's just it blows my mind that, that this is even a discussion among leadership of the church anywhere. It should never be a discussion. God's word's already answered the question. Why are we talking about it? But this is what's happening in the world today. Now, verse 10, he continues, But let these also be first tested, and then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. And this goes along with what we studied last week regarding God not laying on, or regarding men not laying on hands too quickly, but first let them be proved. Let them be uh, proven to be who they say they are. In Second Corinthians eight twenty two through twenty three, he's speaking of Titus here, and he says, "And we have sent with him Titus, our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you." And if anyone inquires about Titus, this one that we've sent to you, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the church. The church is the glory of Christ. So, so Paul is saying we're sending this individual out. He's been proven. He's been tested. He's been diligent in many things. And now even more diligent. So he didn't just pick a new believer and send him to the church to minister. Titus has been proven. He's a fellow worker and partner, according to Paul, is what he's doing, and he's sending him out. And in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, uh, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So to be diligent means that we are to remain focused on God, His word, allowing the Holy Spirit to do His work in us, and that we begin to continue to die to ourselves, to walk out within the calling of what He's placed upon our lives, and that presents us as approved. 
We're no longer clinging to the world. We're no longer hanging on to the, the baggage of our past, but we're submitting that to God, and we're dying to that. Now, does that mean that, that you're completely perfect in all your ways? No, it means that you have grace just like everybody else has grace, but your heart is determined and diligent to stay focused on truth, not to turn to the left, not to turn to the right, but to walk out in the truth of what God is calling you to be. So diligence is very important, and, and, uh, and it goes again, as I mentioned last week, about not, not having a new person that comes in. It's a new believer move into ministry. You just you can't do that. They, you don't know really if they're sold out or if they're just in partly with one foot in, one foot out. You have to give it time, give it some maturity. And here at Calvary Chapel, we, we have a policy I'm not saying that we stick to it absolute because God will has every authority here to override the policy that we put into place. But for the most part is we don't allow someone to come into the church and minister in the church for at least six months. We want to get to know them. We want them to get to know us. We want to know that we're of like mind, that we are uh, of kindred spirit. Because many times people come and they have many qualifications and they could be a Christian for many years, but backgrounds or things that they prefer may not be how we do things here. And so we want to get to know them and we want them to get to know us. And if it's a fit and they feel like this is where God's called them, then we begin to, to minister with them and serve with them. And, and if, they're, if they're raised up and called, then we want to have them raise up in ministry as well. But one of the biggest reasons, it's not just because we don't want to put somebody in front. It's because a lot of times people come and they're wounded, and we want them to have time to heal. We want people to have time to, to rest in the Lord and just know that they can be fed, they can be prayed for, they can be ministered to. And, and so this is, this is a policy that we have. But like I said, there, there are times when God will bring someone, and we know from day one. I mean, just a, just a kindred spirit. But we still wait it out until the Lord gives us the okay. And then at that time, policies are policies. God overrides everything. And we want to trust Him with everything that we do here. Now verses 11 through 16. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, and faithful in all things. And let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own households well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith of which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. So as we see these closing verses here, we see again some consistencies here, deacons being the husband of one wife, ruling their children in their home well. We covered that last week. Um, and for those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ, Christ Jesus. This is the proving process. This is what we're talking about. They've been proven to this point. They continue to prove themselves in the relationship with the Lord. And as they serve in Christ, they are raised up, they are called, and they are meant to be in positions that they're placed into. But as we've said already, the one thing that you have to be careful of is to make sure that someone that may have some qualifications may also have some pride. There might be some other areas. And so just because they have qualifications doesn't mean that they're called. Qualifications do not make a person in leadership. God chooses sometimes the ignorant. Hello. <laughs> to whatever he's called them to do. I saw that amen in the back, by the way. He causes those, uh, he goes against the grain. He doesn't always pick the most educated. He doesn't always pick the most knowledgeable. He doesn't, doesn't always pick the best presenters. He picks those who he picks because that's who he's chosen to do. 
And so we, as the church, have to be faithful in that as well. We want to accept those he's called, but we want to make sure that they are called and that they're the ones that God has put into place. And then he says, I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. Paul had such a heart for all of the churches. And if he could have gone to every one of them over and over and over, he would have till the day he died. Unfortunately, he was imprisoned so, many, so much of his ministry and so much of these letters, so many of these letters that we read were written while he was in prison. But he had such a heart for the people. And he wants to present to them, this is my heart, this is what I'm telling you, I'm giving you instruction here, and oh, I wished I could come. I wished I could be there. But he sends Timothy. He sends Timothy because Timothy is well proven. And he's faithful to the Lord. And he continues to instruct Timothy throughout this, this book and uh, 2 Timothy as well. But he's talking about how to conduct ministry, how leadership should be set up, how it should be structured. And this is what he's given the church here. But then uh, verse 16 is a summation of the gospel. This is just, it's just when you really look at what he, what he says here, he really puts the gospel right there in the closing of this particular part of the letter. It says, God manifested in the flesh. Well, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He became man. He was born into the flesh. He became like us. And we know that he was tempted as we are all tempted. He was tempted. And he died. A perfect man, sinless, took the sins of the world upon himself on our behalf. The Holy Spirit given to testify of Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. He's seen by angels, both in heaven and on earth. And Paul's primary mission was to preach to the Gentiles. And many received and believed because he preached to them. This was his calling. You've seen by the Gentiles, seen by the world. And we know that Jesus rose from the dead and was received in glory when he ascended into the clouds. He was seen by the angels. He's preached among the Gentiles, believed in the world, and he was received up in glory. And they had witnesses, so many witnesses, that saw all of these things taking place. And Paul testifies of all this in saying, This is without controversy. Well, you can look around and say, well, my goodness, the church has more controversy than anything, in, than anything I know of. How can Paul say this is no controversy? Because Paul is sticking to the truth of the gospel. And according to the truth of the word of God, there's no controversy in it. And there shouldn't be controversy among believers. If we focus on Jesus, our differences can be put aside and we can love Jesus together. But the differences are mostly preferential. Some of them, uh, they claim, are more uh, spiritual than they, than they actually are, how you do this, how you do that. But it's Jesus Christ. There's no controversy in Jesus among believers if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's much controversy in the world against the church and the church standing against the world. There's, there's a lot of controversy there. But he's saying within the, 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 the confines of the church itself, there's no controversy, and we should never have any exchange of controversy revolving around Jesus Christ and who he is and what he did. It's all in the Word, and it's also proven historically. It's proven historically. There are many writings that testify of these events. There are many outside of the Bible that testify of the events. And the word itself says that over 500 witnessed his ascension. It's a lot of people. And there's no controversy in any of this. The controversy lies on those who refuse to see truth. Anyone who decides that they're not going to believe, or anyone who wants to pick apart the Bible and believe only certain parts, and refuse to accept the full counsel of God's word, then there's controversy there. And that's the flesh against the spirit. And that controversy has been going on from, that, from, from creation, basically, in the fall, the controversy of the flesh. The spirit was dead until Jesus came, and now we have our spirits revived and alive in him. But there's a controversy only because 
those who refuse to see their truth. And their own pride and their own arrogance, they deny God's word. They deny who he is. And they would rather believe man-made tales of fabrication or theories by guys with lab coats on to explain a creation, a creation that only God could have done. Mathematically, no theory comes up with anything else. They throw them out there. But mathematically, it is impossible that we could have just, boom, here we are. It's, it's, there's, it's mathematically impossible for that to happen. But yet, these scientists continue to hang on to this theory. And they have these fabrications. And when science finally gets a little further along and they realize their theory can't be supported, they alter it a little bit. But they've left out the only thing that works. That's God himself. They've left that out. And when you take God out of it, you can say anything you want to say and you'll have people that believe it as long as they don't have to believe in a supreme being. And so we have all of this stuff going on around us. And many will stand, and I'm convinced of this, that when it's time to stand before Jesus, there will be many in their lab coat standing there. They'll be standing there. And they may have thought they were going to defend their position before the living God. But it'll be too late for them. They'll have all their degrees, all their papers, their pedigrees, all the writings that they've done, all the theories that they've come up with. And they'll stand before Jesus. And they will all be expelled right in front of them. Because Jesus is truth. And you can't stand in the face of truth with a lie. So it doesn't matter what the world comes out with. And they will come out with some doozies. And they still do every day. You know, they really believe that? Um, but they do. There's things out there. When you take God out of it, you're on a spiral downhill. And as you continue to spiral down, you will spill out anything out of your mouth and out of your head to try to keep yourself afloat. And many people will still follow with you. That's the sad thing. We have a lot of people today that will follow documentaries and follow uh, smart people to their death because they don't understand truth. We need to be praying, praying for one another, praying for the lost, that the Lord may move in his spirit upon those and change the hearts of those who are following the wrong directions here. In 1 Corinthians 1, 19-21, says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached, to save those who believe. See, the gospel is foolishness to the wisdom of the world. There was a saying, it may have been a song, and you probably all heard it somewhere along the line. I know I'm not sure who wrote it, but it says, if I'm a fool for Jesus, whose fool are you? I'd rather be a fool for Jesus, to stand on his word, and go against all the wisdom of the world, to go against all the ones who stand up and, and look good and, and smell good and act good in their language and all the stuff they put out there, but they're spewing out lies. They stand against the Word of God. I would rather be a fool for Jesus than the fool that they're representing and the fool that they are for representing the enemy because you're either with the Lord or you're against Him. There's no, there's no middle ground at this point. I know in life, you know, there's a lot of gray areas. People, you know, you have the, this gray area and you're kind of close to the line here or whatever it might be. And, and you can't always see in the way of the world how to do certain things because of the gray areas. You want black and white. But you can't force black and white into the world. But in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's black or white. It's Jesus or it's Satan. There are no two, there's no other uh, choices there. That's it. And we're either with him or we're against him. And this is where we need to really understand that I would rather be a fool for him and be with him in eternity than to be a fool serving the enemy 
Not that I want to go out and steal and kill and do all of the things. That's what Satan does through us, though, who don't know him, who don't know Jesus. That's what Satan will do. It's his job. That's what it is, to steal, to kill, to destroy. And he's out to do that among families. He's out to do that among Christians. He's out to do it even among non-Christians. If he can eliminate them before they know Jesus, he feels like he's got one he can check off. And so we have to make sure where we stand in our walk. Who do we believe? And in the areas that we don't understand, we still trust. We hold on to faith. We hang on to him with all that we have. Believing and knowing that he is the one that has the answers. And if he had meant for us to know all the things, he would have given it to us. It's okay to say, I don't know. But I do know Jesus. And I'll be a fool for him any day over this world. Father, we thank you for again for your word. We thank you for your truth and what you teach us and what you show us. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that... That, Lord, your spirit would sustain us in all things because it, this world is not an easy place to live. It's not an easy place, Lord. We know there's a lot of danger on every corner. And we know, Lord, that sometimes we can be caught alone. But we thank you, Lord, that we're not alone with you. You're always with us. You're always caring us. You're always guiding us. Your Holy Spirit dwells within us. And I thank you for your, uh, your church, Lord, your people who reach out and minister to one another in faith, in obedience to your word, that we all...